And uh, I just praise God when I think about the connections we make in our, in our workplace, in our community, and how God just uh, brings a couple like Zach and Sarah along. And, and they're a testimony to when you honor God, he's going to honor you. And uh, in our finances, that's such a huge, huge thing. And so uh, thanks, you guys, for sharing. And they wanted to let the body know, meaning the church, that uh, they want to scholarship someone to go through it uh, in January. So um, thank you guys for, for making that available. So um, nine weeks. It used to be, what, 24 weeks? Um, they've, they've really reduced this thing. So nine weeks, and uh, it's so worth your time. And I will tell you right now, too, to go through at FPU, uh, I think a companion volume, if you're interested in the topic of, of money, possessions, and eternity, well, just so happens that's the title of this book, by Randy Alcorn. Pick up this book. Do not walk. Run and grab this. Get it Amazon. Get it Barnes & Noble, however you need to get it. This is going to help complement not only the FPU journey, but the journey we make regularly here as far as being a church that has a culture of generosity fantastic fantastic stuff and today we get to dive in the book of proverbs so turn in your bibles let's start at proverbs 30 um but let me pray let me pray for uh for my voice i know jacob's voice is is feeling it i know several of you have been sick this week how many of you have been sick this week how many of you are going to be sick next week just raise your hand just curious yeah we're, we're all there so father be glorified in this time thank you for loving us and for giving us this this opportunity to not only express our devotion to you through music. But Lord, I pray that uh, we would meet you now with our hearts just laid open and just exposed to what you would have us learn, how you would have us be challenged, Lord, how you would have us be convicted so that we can seek to glorify and honor you all the more, especially out of this topic of, of finances, Lord, the money you've entrusted to us, the possessions you have given to us. May we continue to understand how they are to be leveraged for your kingdom work for your glory, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So as I was thinking this week about, um, and I was meditating on the fact that generosity really is evidence of a, of a changed heart. And I, and I want you to maybe write that thought down in your notes. Generosity is evidence of a regenerate heart. The, the person that truly comes to know Christ, I believe, cannot help but be the most generous person in the world. I really firmly believe that the Bible gives us a picture like that. If you think about generosity in the Bible and the people that were broken because of Jesus and yet built up and healed because of Jesus, Zacchaeus, who is this crooked tax collector, he comes to know Jesus and the very first thing Zacchaeus wants to do is make his accounts right. And he says, if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back fourfold what I've cheated them out of. And I sit there and go, are you kidding me? This is what the gospel does. It turns uh, ragged people into generous people. Think about the prostitute in Luke 7 who comes to Jesus through the, the hall of Pharisees and Sadducees. Remember the lesson last week on Pharisees? Remember what I told you you need to do? Okay, let's go back. So in Luke 7... The prostitute comes down that, that row of uh, uh, on that Pharisee's house, ooh, and she beelines it to Jesus, and what does she do? She takes her alabaster vial of perfume and breaks it at the feet of Christ as showing her sign of repentance and remorse and, and contrition. And so here's a woman who takes everything she has and breaks it at the feet of Christ. That's what a generous person does as evident of a regenerate heart. Think about the woman in Mark 12 who gives everything she has in the offering. That's generosity as a result of a regenerate heart. Think about the Apostle Paul who's transformed on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 and he devotes himself to the gospel and to the kingdom work for the rest of his life. That is a generous man who is generous as a result of a regenerate heart. Think about the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 who out of their poverty gave wealth to the church. I mean, think about this. Paul says those Macedonians had nothing to give and yet they still gave generously. Why? Because they were a changed people. 
And if you think there's only New Testament examples of generosity, go back to Moses in the wilderness with the people of Israel where he needed to take up an offering to build the tabernacle. And he basically had to stop the people from giving because they gave too much. I would love there to be a Sunday where I stand in front of the offering box and I sit there and go, this is closed, you guys. We can't take any more. See, what we see throughout Scripture is that generosity is something that we don't do by duty. We do it because we've delighted ourselves in the Lord. Generosity is evidence of a changed heart. And who ought to be the most generous people in the world? The believer in Christ. That's who. You and I. And so we have a lot to learn. Last week we looked at a unique parable. Luke 16, talking about the dishonest manager and how there's people in this world that put believers to shame by how they think about money How much more should we have incredible wisdom when it comes to the money and possessions God's entrusted to us, not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth, but to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven? Because what are the only two things that will last for eternity? The souls of men and women and the word of God. So today we turn to the book of Proverbs. And we're going to look, and now look at your outline. There's a lot of stuff in your outline. And I just want you to to just take a deep breath. We're not going to look at all the Proverbs, all right, that are listed on your insert on your program, in your outline. But we're going to look at a few of them because the book of Proverbs contains so much information, especially when it comes to the topic of money and possessions. And so if you have your outline open and your Bible open, we're going to look at two things in Proverbs. We're going to look at the warnings about money and possessions, and we're going to look at the wisdom about money and possessions. And hopefully I'm going to give you some really practical stuff to get us going on the road to generosity because it is a topic that ought to be a part of our lives every day as followers of Christ. As a matter of fact, take it out your insert in your program with the announcements on one page. If you turn that announcement page over, you'll look at the core competencies we believe as, in, as a church. There are beliefs, there are virtues, and there are practices. And you notice one of the practices is that we will be a community of generous people. We believe that generosity is one of the ways we show the gospel to the world. One of the ways we not only show kindness and compassion to one another, but to those that are poor, to those that are needy, to those that are oppressed, to those that are facing injustice. We as the church are called to come alongside those and help alleviate a lot of those difficulties. And so we turn to Proverbs. Now let me, two things that you need to know about the book of Proverbs. Because there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. There is so much in Proverbs, it will be easy to feel like you're drowning in wisdom. And that's what the book of Proverbs is. It's it's wisdom literature. It's a father teaching his son about how life generally works. And what the father passes on to the son are basic life principles, not necessarily promises. Please write this down. Proverbs are not promises, they are principles. Because I have a parent will come up to me and say, well, the book of Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older, he shall not depart from it. And they come to me and they say, how come the word of God says this, and my child does not care one single bit about Jesus? Right? How many of you as parents, and you don't need to raise your hand, have tried to raise your children in the instruction of the Lord, the admonition of the Lord, and yet your kids don't care one bit about Jesus. And you sit there and look at Proverbs and go, but it says, train up a child in the ways of the Lord, and when he's older, he'll not depart from it. This is how things generally work. It's not a promise that your child will become saved, or he will, or she will become a believer. These are not promises, they are principles. Is that helpful? Yes. Because the wisdom of Solomon, who wrote the majority of the Proverbs, has to do with things pertaining to life that generally operate in a certain way. And the second thing you need to know about Proverbs is that even though this this literature was written 3,000 years ago, it is timeless and relevant for today. God's word is living and active, and it is applicable to not only Solomon's time, but our time today. Is that not awesome or what? So two categories this morning warnings about money and possessions, and secondly, wisdom about money and possessions. Let's start. Six things that I have categorized. I'm going to tell you right now, this took a long time this week to try to categorize a book of so much wisdom 
uh, I basically came up with six points that I want us to consider. Number one is this, that the warning is you need to avoid the extremes. Look at Proverbs 30, if you would. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. This is probably one of my favorite Proverbs. And just so you know, if you ever want to uh, start someplace in the Scripture, Start with the book of Proverbs, because you notice there's 31 chapters. That's a chapter a day, and a chapter a day keeps the devil away. So that, that's a pretty good rule right there. So uh, read a chapter a day, and you're good, right? Proverbs 30, verses 7 and 9. Two things I ask of you, Lord, and do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. So you notice the extremes? Don't make me so poor and don't make me so wealthy feed me with the food that is my portion lest i be full and deny you and say who is the lord or lest i be in want and steal and profane the name of my god so notice the wisdom there here's the warning there's those that have so much wealth they really don't need god and that's really the deceptive nature of of wealth isn't it it gives the appearance of god gives this appearance of security and that you're okay and then you sit there and go who's the lord you don't have a you don't have a need for god there's no dependency upon god but then again if you're poor boy i tell you what you're tempted to do things you wouldn't do because you need to provide for yourself or need to provide for your family and so the writer says you need to avoid these extremes number two you need to ignore the pace and what i mean by that it's another way of saying Stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. How many of us live life trying to compete with all those people around us that are buying new houses, new cars, new clothes, new bikes, new computers, new TVs? I mean, you want to talk about seeds of discontentment all around us. I, I still, even just to this day, my, my youngest child the other day, was uh, was with some friends and uh you know all he could talk about was the size of his friend's house uh the cars that they're driving and there's something inside me and says what you don't like our house you don't like our car and all of a sudden you know there's something to me and i sit there and go but at the end of the day it's not the size of your house that's important is it it's not the kind of car you drive is it and so the the, the book of proverbs says Quit trying to keep up with those around you because there's always going to be somebody that has less than you and there's always going to be somebody that has more than you and it was the famous John Rockefeller who said, you know, he was asked the question, how much money is enough? And his response was, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Look at Proverbs 13, if you would. Proverbs 13, 7. And here's what the writer has to say about this. There is one who pretends to be rich, but has nothing. And there's one who pretends to be poor, but has great wealth go ahead and just live life simply don't try to keep up with people don't try to to try to measure up with everybody else's standards just be who you are in christ don't probably try to be pretend to be somebody you're not because again the principle is true when it comes to keeping up with people you spend money you don't have to buy things you can't afford to impress people you really don't like amen hashtag truth all right number three Face the equality, meaning when all is said and done, every single man and woman stands naked before God. See, in, in the God's eyes, he does not look at how much you possess, how much wealth you have accumulated. C.S. Lewis said it like this. I love this quote. He said, he who has God and everything has no more than he who only has God. Think about that. He who has God and everything has no more than he who has God alone. Look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 2. Here's what the writer says. The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. When all is said and done, it doesn't matter what you have, what you've possessed, how much you've accumulated, naked you've come into this world and naked you're going to leave. That's what Job talks about. And there's a man who had a lot of riches stripped from his life. And yet we need to realize this. No one's going to take anything 
with them once they pass on into eternity. Number four, see the ugliness. Meaning, what poverty does, what the poor experience, is nothing beautiful. And the Proverbs talks a lot about how we are called to take care of the poor. And it's ugly in two ways. Number one, the poor suffer for not being able to take care of themselves. I mean, when a poor person gets a flat tire, they think about, how do I get money to repair my tire? They get, they get sick, how do I get money to buy medicine or even afford to go see a doctor? And so the ugliness of poverty is something that we should always, be, uh, we should always recognize. But not only that, but the injustice that the poor experience. Uh, think of payday lending and, and, and the exorbitant interest rate, those places give people 20, 25, 30% interest so that someone can make sure they can buy groceries or pay a car, ma- car payment or et cetera, et cetera. And so there's several pro- uh, proverbs that talk about how poverty is something we should recognize. It is ugly, it is disgusting, and yet we as believers are called to help alleviate those that are impoverished. Several verses there to check out. Look at Proverbs 10 to 15 just to start. Proverbs 10, 15. And I know this is probably like looking at a bunch of fortune cookie fortunes all in a row, uh, but that's the way Proverbs is written. 10, 15, the rich man's wealth is his fortress. The ruin of the poor is their poverty. So that has to do just with the general condition of poverty. But if you go to Proverbs chapter 22, verses 16, it says this, he who oppresses the poor, this is the injustice point, to make much for himself or who gives the rich will only come to poverty. Meaning God says there is judgment for those who get rich at the poor's expense. Number five, we're going through this fast, aren't we? Isn't this good? Beware the fakeness. And there's no other way to, money attracts people and when you don't have money, you no longer attract people. You ever gone, you ever got, there's my ESPN app. I should have, I should have disabled that. You think I'd learn my lesson, huh? Hey, Scott, the Cowboys are playing on, whatever. There are, you know, you go to a, I mean, money draws people like a picnic draws ants, basically, right? All of a sudden you have wealth, and now you have friends coming out of the woodwork. And you ought to be careful because the moment you ha- don't have wealth or the moment you don't have friends. I mean, think of the prodigal son, right? Who took the, fa- the inheritance that was due him. His dad gave it to him. He went and just partied it up. And the moment he didn't have anything left was the moment everyone dis- uh, uh, abandoned him. And Proverbs says you need to be careful because there's a lot of fake people out there. The moment they hear you got money, all of a sudden they're your bestie, right? Proverbs 19, verse 4. Turn there if you would. Wealth adds many friends, but a poor man is separated from his friend. See, even poverty affects relationships. But just because you have wealth doesn't mean you have quality relationships. Proverbs says, be careful. And the last point is this. Flee the illusions. And I mentioned this earlier, that money, wealth, possessions gives the illusion that you're okay. When in reality, it gives you a false sense of security. There's things that money can't buy. On my way here, I had my son in the car, and we're listening to uh, one of the radio stations that plays the Beatles every Sunday morning. That's all they play is the Beatles. And guess what song came on as we're pulling in the parking lot? Can't Buy Me Love. And I thought, well, isn't this ironic? And even John Lennon and Paul McCartney talked about what money can't buy And it not only cannot buy love, it cannot buy a reputation, it cannot buy integrity, it cannot buy salvation, and yet it gives the illusion that when you have accumulated so much stuff, you have all those things. And I'm going to tell you right now, money isn't everything, and it can't buy life's most precious possessions. Someone once said it this way, and I love this. Money will buy a bed, but not sleep. Money will buy books, but not brains. It will buy food, but not an appetite. It will buy finery, but not beauty. It will buy a house, but not a home. It will buy medicine, but not health. It will buy luxuries, but not culture. It will buy amusement, but not happiness. It will buy a crucifix, but not a savior. It will buy a church pew, but it will not buy heaven. So true, isn't it? 
that we need to realize that, that where our, heart, our treasure is, that's where our hearts are going to be. And that's why Jesus says you cannot serve both God and wealth, God or riches, God and money. Because money gives the appearance that it will provide everything, everything for you that only God truly wants to give you. And that is where we must find our satisfaction in God and God alone because money will take from you what it wants to and leave you in the end empty. And that's why we shift gears and now talk about the wisdom of money and possessions. So what does the, the Bible say specifically in Proverbs about wealth, money, possessions? There's four topics we're going to talk about. Wisdom in relation to wealth in general. Uh, wisdom in relation to work. Wisdom in relation to God. And wisdom in relation to others. Four main categories. Number one, relation to wealth. Over, over half the Proverbs on wealth, Solomon says, value wealth, but don't trust wealth. Wealth is not a bad thing in and of itself. When it gets bad is ultimately when it becomes so gripping on your heart that you begin to pursue it versus God. And so Solomon says there's wisdom in valuing wealth, but do not trust it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 18. Look at verses 10 and 11. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it, and it's safe. But a rich man's wealth is his strong city, like a high wall in his own imagination. See, you are wise when you put your trust in God. You are unwise if you put your trust in your wealth, because all your wealth does is give the illusion that you're safe and you're secure. And we know that's not true. Look at the, par <coughs> excuse me, the parable of Luke 16. The rich man and Lazarus, right? The rich man is unnamed. It could be anybody, but Lazarus is named. He was the poor one that even just wanted uh, crumbs from the master's table. And in eternity, the, it was Lazarus that got eternal life, and it was the rich man that was sent to eternal punishment. And there's a perspective there that says, value wealth just don't trust it. Number two, wealth is fleeting and accumulation is dangerous. Look at Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Stop right there. How true is this for people in, in this world? How many people have you seen get weary in pursuing wealth? How many of you have gotten weary in pursuing wealth. So the writer says, do not wear yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. Isn't that true? I love one of my favorite comedians, Brian Regan. Any Brian Regan fans out there? I love Brian Regan. Clean comedy, same with J Jim Gaffigan. Love those guys. But Brian Regan talks about, you know, the kid that gets the balloon at the amusement park. And all of a sudden, the balloon... Like, he loses it, and all of a sudden starts flying up, and the kid starts crying like crazy, like he's lost everything. And Brian Regan basically just says, well, just imagine if your wallet all of a sudden just took off. I mean, that's what it's like, right? It's like, no, there you go. Imagine the things we buy, we invest in, that God basically says, you're not going to take it with you. It's eventually all going to disappear. That's why you don't put stock in it. And so... We need to understand this important principle. God, is, God has called us to be channels of generosity, not storehouses of greed. See, the reason he has given you what he has given to you is so that you can be a vehicle or a conduit to help bless others, not to stockpile riches for yourself. We see in the parable, the rich man, Jesus said, what is it, what is it basically profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? Nothing. Nothing. You get, in the end, nothing. So Leo Tolstoy, Russian writer, you know the message is going to get good when you start quote quoting the Russians, right? 
No one knows the human soul like the Russian writers, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, those guys. Uh, Leo Tolstoy wrote a short story, and it's entitled, How Much Land Does a Man Need? So this man comes to this landowner, and the landowner tells this man, you can have all the land you want that I possess. So much as you walk the distance and make it back by sunset, you can have whatever you cover. So the guy goes, sweet! So he begins to walk, right? And he's kind of timing himself, making sure that as far as he goes out, he needs to allow himself the same amount of time to get back. So he says, okay, I can go a little bit further. Starts to see the sun setting, right? He's like, I can go a little bit further. And then he gets to a point where he's gone so far, he's like, well, I need, I need to start hightailing it back. So the guy starts going back, the sun's setting, the sun's setting. He starts sprinting, right? And then he's just hauling, right? He's just sweating. And all of a sudden, he makes it almost to the man's farm, and the guy collapses over dead. And Tolstoy says, how much man does a land, a man, a land, does a man need? About three feet by six feet by about eight feet. They bury him right there. A sobering truth, isn't it? That how much do we really need? And we, we pursue wealth as if it's the end-all, be-all. We pursue wealth as if it's the thing that's going to bring us the greatest satisfaction. And in the end, what do we end up with? Nothing. And the wisdom of Solomon says, be careful. Do not pursue these things. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you pursue wealth, you're stupid. That's, that's Scott Morgan's proverb, all right? If you pursue wealth, you're stupid. Why? Because houses break down, cars rust, ha- uh, bank accounts dwindle, things will fall apart, and in the end, you don't need anything but your soul. There's wisdom. How about in relation to work? Why is work important in the topic of wealth? Because God wants us to devote ourselves to hard work to gain an income. I'm gonna, can I just spell a, a, a myth right now? Work is not a result of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Right? There's people who say, well, doggone it, work came as a result of Adam and Eve's disobedience and we shouldn't do it. I'm going to tell you right now, God said to Adam and Eve before the fall happened in Genesis 2, you're to go out and be fruitful and multiply and work the land. And work is a great thing. God says in, in Proverbs that if you're a lazy person, he's not going to bless you. Hard work is important. Two truths. Number one, hard work leads to wealth. Proverbs 12, 11. Check this out. So you need to get out there and work. You need to put your hands to something useful. He says this. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues vain things lacks sense. Can I tell you right now, there is no get quick, get rich quick scheme out there. Do you know people that are trying to get rich quick? If I only win the lottery. Can I tell you what that looked like in my world? I was known years ago as the game show pastor. Some of you didn't know this about me. I was on two game shows in uh, 2001 and 2005. I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire with Regis Philbin. Uh, and I was on Family Feud with Richard Karn. You should have seen the expression on my face when I lost on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire at the $8,000 level. I was just ready to, we were just planting our first church in 2000, 2001, and I had already spent the money in my head. Like, oh man, what we're going to do for the kingdom and what we're going to do for Jesus. And I got on to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I, I won the fast finger round. I got in the, the hot seat. And even Regis, who knows my stepbrother in New York, uh, remembers me because I rushed up on stage like I was going to grab Regis and like hold him over my shoulder and do one of these things. And I guess the week before someone had done that. And so Regis like was like, oh no, not another one, right? And he put up his hands and we kind of just did this kind of fake sparring with each other. And Regis told my, my stepbrother, oh yeah, I remember your, bro- your stepbrother and blah, blah, blah. I'm flying through the answers. And I'm going, I got this thing. And at the $8,000 level, it all came crashing down. And I have to remember, life is not a get-rich-quick setup. You have to devote yourself to intentional, purposeful labor. 
You need to be careful with trying to get rich. Gambling is another way of people trying to, to get rich quick. It's like you're waiting for Aunt Bessie to die. You're thinking you're going to get rich quick. You know, it's not going to happen. God says, I want you to know that hard work leads to wealth, and God's main provision of providing for you is going to be through hard and wise labor. Number two, godly wisdom needs to direct that wealth. How many people make money but don't have wisdom in how to utilize that money? Have you ever known people like this? Have you been that kind of person? And so look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16. The writer says this, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Meaning, better you come with what you have and say, God, how do you want me to spend this? How do you want me to save this? How do you want me to utilize this? Versus amassing great wealth and not considering the Lord in the process at all. We need wisdom to direct our wealth. Number three, in relation to God. Now, this is where it gets fun and gets good. Turn to Proverbs 3. Perhaps one of the most important verses on giving in the entire Bible. It is quoted in Financial Peace University classes. It is quoted in Crown Financial Ministries uh, material is one of those verses that my children are memorizing this semester at school. Like we're sitting around the dinner table and they're like, Dad, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord from the first fruits of your labor, right? So that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Here's what Solomon is getting at. Number one, honor God first. Remember what I brought up last week with the whole... Um, order of days after thanksgiving you've got black friday you've got cyber monday and if there's anything left over you've got giving tuesday right it ought to be giving friday and then let's talk about black saturday and then cyber monday or whatever the problem is when we approach finances we do not seek to honor god first we spend it on us and usually there's nothing left over, and so we say, God, we'll catch you next time. And Solomon says wisdom, financially, is giving God the first cut. I got paid on Friday. How do I know I got paid on Friday? Because I opened my bank account, and there was money in my bank account, which me, my wife, my kids are to totally grateful for. And guess what happens? Once I get paid, the very first check I write is to the ministry here at Missio Day. Done. Because it would be so easy to spend that on other things. Especially this time of year, and you go to Sam's Club or Costco, and there's like, oh, big screen TVs on sale. Ooh, bikes that, are, you know, you just can't live without, and all this other stuff, right? And no, it's, it's one of those things where I sit there and go, no, God, you deserve the first fruits. You've given me the job. You've given me the capacity to do the job. You've given me this ability to produce for you and for others. So therefore, I'm going to honor you from the first fruits of my labor. And so number one, you give first to God. Notice the order here in verse 9 and 10. 9 is the command. 10 is the result of obeying the command. Number one, you honor God first. And I'm going to tell you right now, you as a believer in Christ do not get a hall pass on giving. If you're not a giving Christian, I would question if you're a believer in Christ at all. Because Malachi, oh, or Malachi, the Italian prophet, says in chapter 3, you cannot afford to not give. And if, if the gospel is truly sunken into your heart, you ought to be the most generous person in the world as a result of that, just like those examples I gave you at the beginning of the message. And I'm going to tell you right now that you honor God first, and then the result of obeying the command is verse 10, you're going to be blessed in return. Now I'm going to, let me dispel a myth. This is not a dollar for dollar blessing that God is promising you. 
Well, pastor, I wrote that big fat check to the church, and now how come I'm not getting that same dollar-for-dollar blessing in return? Here's the thing with the blessing of God. You need to think of blessing beyond monetary terms. Number one blessing you receive is the fact that you've been obedient to the commands of God, and that alone ought to delight your spirit. Amen? Number two, you ought to continue to be generous through the fact that God is going to still provide you a job, means, and talents, and experiences to do your job, and he'll just continue to increase that because the more generous he sees you being, he goes, you're a good investment. I'm going to keep you employed. I'm going to keep you doing it. And so there's the blessing that says, I get to do work. I get to put my hands to work. And so think about all, and then there's the blessing of seeing others' lives change that you get to be generous towards in alleviating their, alleviating their situation, helping them out in their poverty. And so there's three blessings right there that have no monetary value to you whatsoever. So what we have to remember is that you honor God first. And I'm going to tell you right now, and you're going to want to write this down. This is good. This is Fortune cookie worthy, right here. Giving breaks the power of greed in your heart. Generosity is the antidote to the greed that lies within you. You want to become less greedy? Start giving. And if you're saying, I'm still greedy and I'm giving, then give more. I'm not going to stand in front of the offering box. No, it's overflowing. No. God says you are to be a giving person because giving and generosity are the only things that break the power of greed in your soul. That's why 1 Timothy 6, Paul says, teach those who are rich to be generous Generous in good works, generous in good deeds, for you're going to show them that the life that truly matters is not of this world, it's the world to come. And, and that's, the, that's the spirit. Okay, a couple really practical things right here. Number one, so many people say, well, where do I start? I'm going to say, you got to start with something, right? And then there's people that hear the 10% rule. The Bible does not say you give 10% of your income. Nowhere does the Bible say that. Well, Scott, does it say in the Old Testament that Israel was required to give 10%? No. You know what Israel was required to give? Catch this. 25% mandatory offerings. How many of you like 10% now? (laughs) Mandatory offerings for Israel, 25%. On top of mandatory, mon, uh, mandatory, there were free will offerings that could be, be even up to 35%. Why? So that Israel, the community, the family, the people were provided for. There were some who had more than others, and God said, we are going to make this a communal system. And you're to give 25% mandatory and up to 35% with free, uh, free will offerings added on top of that. So when it comes to the Bible and tithes, it is a myth. The real question is not like, hey, should I give, you know, what should I give God out of my finances? Here's the real question for the believer. What of God's resources should I hold on to for myself? See, that's the mentality. Because here's the point. Psalm 24, verse 1. God owns it all. A-L-L. All means all, and that's all all means, Right? The fact that you are not an owner, you're a manager. And that God says you're to honor me first, and we ought to totally consider by the Spirit's work in us, what is it that we are called to give? Because if you want to start at 10%, great, start there, but don't make it the ceiling of your giving, make it the floor of your giving. Start to give 15%, start to give 20%. Write down these four Ps, you ready? Side side notes in in your outline. Number one, priority. Number two, percentage. Number three, progressive. And number four, prompted. Let's talk through these. This is, this is practical application. 
just start giving a percentage of your income and stay faithful to it. All I know, the safe rule is to start doing something, not giving a, you know, so many people are like, well, I can't give 10%, so I'm not going to start, I'm not going to give anything. Or I can't give 20%, so I'm not going to, start with something. Forego the two sausage McMuffin sandwiches at McDonald's you go get once a week. Don't forego your sozo mocha during the week. <laughs> Skip the Chipotle burrito for lunch. Skip the movie you're going to go see, you know, whenever. Just make sacrifices and say, I'm going to honor God first. I'm going to give a percentage of my giving and stay on that. Number two, percentage giving, or no, priority giving. So priority giving, number one, honor God first. Make him a priority. Number two, percentage giving. Number three, progressive giving. As your income increases, make sure it's progressively also reflected in your finances. You get a raise, you get a bonus. Guess what? Continue to bump up the percentage. Be progressive as God increases your wealth. And number four, prompted giving. Meaning there are going to come occasions in your life where all of a sudden some, someone comes to you with a need you should be in a position to say, you know what, I can give $100 to that person to help them out. This is above and beyond. Those, those moments when all of a sudden there's something that drops into your lap, you sit there and go, I'm going to help that ministry, I'm going to help that person, and you're prompted on the spot to give, and you've allowed your finances to do this sort of blessing. Amen? So, that's good practical stuff right there for you. Number two under that point, and then watch God bless. I'm not a prosperity theology person. I'm not going to sit there and go, you know, this is your best life now and just watch, you know, the money start rolling in. But you need to know that Proverbs are pretty replete with wisdom on how, how God blesses those who bless him and bless others. Proverbs 11, turn there if you would. Verses 24 and 25. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. There is one who scatters yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due, but it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Circle that verse. Make an asterisk by that verse. Highlight that verse. Basically, God says, why would I not want to bless you when you Seek to bless others. Our God is a generous God. Amen? Who in our poverty, Christ comes and becomes impoverished himself so that through our poverty and his poverty, we may be made rich. This is 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And so our God is a generous God. We as his people ought to reflect his generosity. And last point, what about in, our, in a relationship with others? Two, two categories I'm thinking about here. Number one, giving to the poor. And number two, giving to the gospel. Turn to Proverbs 14, verse 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who is gracious to the needy honors God. Him. Again, highlight that verse. Circle that verse. See, God says there is a reward for those who help the poor. There is reward for those that come alongside those that have need in our community. And that's what we seek to do as a church. This is what I, I praise God for your generosity and for your faithfulness. I mean, even Ryan mentioned it. Like, look at the program. We're one Sunday in. To December, it's a five Sunday month, which is always pastor's favorite kind of months, the five Sunday months, and we've already got at least a third of our income that we need for the month. And I sit there and go, I am so excited to sit down with the leaders and say, how do we want to spend God's money to bless others? And then come to you with a report of what the finance team says, we're going to take care of this ministry, we're going to take care of these people, we're going we're to bless others. Even Ryan and I this week were like, okay, we need to get busy. Whose lives will we enrich because God has enriched us? And you guys are vehicles in this whole process. So thank you for helping us 
help others. You're blessing us so we can bless others. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the gospel. Which brings us to the last point. And whatever you do, invest in gospel work. That's why Jesus says in, in Matthew six thirty three, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all other stuff is going to be given to you. See, honor God first. Right there, Jesus affirms it. But also, too, we need to be reminded of what is truly important. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because only two things will last for eternity, the souls of men and women and the word of God. So when gospel opportunities present themselves to you, give to those things. You can forego payway once a week. You can forego, you know, going to the movies, doing whatever. Do not forego investing in the kingdom. Let's close with this. Look at Isaiah chapter 55. I was meditating on this passage and just, again, such a, a rich, rich text for us. Isaiah 55. I close because this is what's ultimately important. What you have as far as wealth, material possessions, what you've accumulated, while in and of themselves are not sinful, they're not evil, we need to remember that there are things that are more important, i.e. the lives of men and women in the gospel. And Isaiah 55 says this in verse 1. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? I mean, stop right there. Is that not a great self-examination question? Why do we buy things that ultimately don't satisfy? Because God's invitation is to, for Him to be your sole satisfaction. Listen carefully to me. He says, and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. See, the invitation to us is an invitation where God says, I've paid your way. I've paid your way to have a relationship with me and nothing is more important than a relationship with God. And in that relationship, we need to realize that He in relationship with us is our sole satisfaction. And we are, we are enriched when our ears listen. We are enriched when our, our feet obey. And we need to realize that there are temptations and enticements in that world that are trying to woo us away from our Creator. And you need to realize that you give to the Gospel because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Stay grounded in Christ. Stay focused on God. And stay in tune with the kingdom work. And then your soul will be satisfied, not in stuff, but in your Savior. Amen? This is truth. This is good. And so, we who are naked and poor and powerless and thieves and ashamed and guilty are given a free invitation into a relationship with God because Christ, Jesus, made that possible. And if you're in Christ today, allow that to be translated into the generosity of all that God's entrusted to you so that others' lives may be enriched because of you. Let's stand. Let's pray. And just so you guys know, I gave you so many month, oh, other psalms or proverbs there. That's your homework this week. Devote yourself in looking at the psalms. And I would tell you this. Make it a point. Read one psalm a day. And anytime a psalm mentions something about money or wealth, make a little M by that verse. And after one month, you'll look back and go, this thing has so much to say about money and possessions. And again, this is not what God wants from you. This is what God wants for you. And so I consider it an honor and a privilege and a joy to be able to, to lead you in this instruction. May God continue to be glorified in this culture of generosity. Amen. Father, 
Thank you for being so good to us. The invitation to drink and to eat and be satisfied in you is a wonderful invitation. And you have done it because of what Christ Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross. And Lord, may we understand that it is you and you alone that can satisfy us like nothing else. And yet, Lord, out of our satisfaction in you comes this opportunity now to share that with others. Find us faithful in giving. Find us faithful in being generous. Find us faithful in giving that which really doesn't belong to us so that others' lives may be benefited. Thanks for being so kind and so compassionate to us, Father. We want to live for your glory and we want to display your goodness on a day-to-day basis. Help us do that. Help us to become less attached to our stuff and more attached to our Savior and be glorified in the process. And we pray this in His name. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Have a wonderful week. May the Lord bless you and keep you and lift your face, His face towards you and give you grace and peace and mercy forever and ever. See you soon, guys. Take care.